بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so today we will begin with the battle of Khaybar uh, we finished the treaty of Hudaybiyah and the next major incident is the battle of Khaybar and before we begin the battle of Khaybar just a very quick uh, recap uh, of the uh, Jewish tribes in the Arabian Peninsula because the Battle of Khaybar represents the final expulsion of the uh, Yehudi tribes that were in uh, Arabia at the time, or I should be more precise, Central Arabia at the time. And a lot of Muslims always get confused between all of the various tribes. So just a quick recap of some of the previous incidents that had taken place about the, the interaction between the Muslims and the uh, Yehud. And who can remind me, how did we have Yehud in Central Arabia, how did they get there? Who can remind me? So one theory says they came from Yemen. That's one theory. Another theory? How did we have Yehud in Central Arabia? So another theory, they were sent by Musa himself looking for a prophet and we said this theory really seems a bit of a stretch in imagination. Uh, but it is found in some of the early books. Uh, another theory is that the Jews of Central Arabia were there from the Jewish diaspora. Now what is the Jewish diaspora? The Jewish diaspora is the expulsion of the Jews from Jerusalem and there are considered to be three diasporas. There are two major ones and one minor one. The major one, the earliest one, took place in 587 BC when the infamous Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Temple of Solomon and he exiled uh, the Jews from Jerusalem and this was the first expulsion and that was when most of them went to Iran uh, and uh, one theory says some came to Arabia but that, honestly that seems way too early because 587 BC means 1000 years before the Prophet's birth that seems too early. The second diaspora took place in 70 CE under the Roman Emperor Titus. Once again the the uh, Temple of Solomon was destroyed and once again the Jews scattered everywhere and it is most likely in this diaspora that the Jews made their way down south to Yemen. Most likely. There was a minor diaspora in 135 CE under the Emperor Hadrian, so basically similar to the 70 CE, just another 50 years after that. Uh, and most likely it was the second diaspora. So the first diaspora when the Jews went to, to, to Iran. And that is why Iran has always had a large Jewish population. To this day there are many Jews in Iran. This goes back to the first diaspora uh, over 2,500 years ago. Uh, the second diaspora took place, as we said, 70 CE. And most likely that was the diaspora that the Jews went down to Yemen. Yemen. And either some of them just settled in Yathrib at the time, that's one theory, or another theory which actually makes more sense, a group of Yemeni Jews, after having settled in Yemen for hundreds of years, they actually went back up north to Yathrib. And this explains many things. This explains why they were Arab in culture, in language, in tribes. Because it is not of the uh, methodology or of the ethnic makeup of the Jews to be divided into these types of tribes. Whereas in Yathrib, they were divided into tribes. You had the Banu Qaynuqa, the Banu Nadir, you had the Banu Qurayda, and you had other small tribes. And it is not uh, of the character of the Jewish nation to be divided into tribes. This is a very Arab thing. Where did they get this from? Most likely, uh, it seems, and this Allah knows best, and I've researched this as much as I'm capable of researching. To me, it seems that the most logical theory is that after the second diaspora of 70 CE, large groups of Jews came and settled in Yemen. And we have historical evidence that Yemeni Jews have been in Yemen for around 2,000 years. Right? We have historical evidence. We have records. Yemen, by the way, we all know Yemen was a civilization far more advanced than Central Arabia where the Prophet ﷺ was sent. Yemen had a kingdom. Yemen had civil, uh, uh, writing. Yemen had a history. We have records from Yemeni kings who are enacting treaties with the Jews. And these treaties, they date back uh, 1,600 years, 1,700 years. So the Jewish presence in Yemen is very ancient. And that's very clear. By the way, there are no Jews in Yemen anymore because in 1947, 48, 49, there was a huge airlifting, uh, which America helped to do uh, as well financially, where they airlifted the Yemeni Jews to the modern nation of Israel. And uh, from what I understand, there's only a handful of Yemeni Jews left 
uh, in Yemen. Literally just maybe 50 or so left. But the bulk of them have been repatriated into Israel and they make up a unique uh, ethnic group because they have a heritage that is different from Ashkenazi and from Sephardim and from uh, Mehrazim. There's three major groups. Yemenis are neither of these. But anyway, they're going to a tangent. Let's get back here. So, Allah knows best, but it appears that the Jews of Central Arabia came from Jerusalem to Yemen in 70 CE. Then, sometime, we don't know when. We have no records whatsoever. And if you remember, this was the problem of the history of the Jews in Arabia. We don't have any records other than the Islamic records. There's no mention of them in non-Islamic sources. So, we don't know when they came, what their history is, and then of course, as we know, eventually all of them were expelled by uh, the Muslims, so we have no record other than what is mentioned in our sources. So, where did they come from? Allah knows, but most likely they came back up from Yemen, maybe a hundred years or 150 years before the advent of the Prophet to Yathrib. Maybe around 200, 300 CE. Not five, six hundred years before the coming of the Prophet Why do we know this? Because if you look at their quantity in Yathrib and their tribes, three major tribes, generally speaking, generally speaking, the more people that are born into a tribe, the more the tribe subdivides. This is the general way. You cannot have too large of a tribe or else it, the, the system doesn't function. Neither can you have too small of a tribe. You need a proper quantity. And the fact that there's three tribes and their quantity probably is around 6,000 male Jews in Medina at the time, 5,000. So 5,000 Jews going back maybe 300 years really does make sense if you extrapolate back that in the beginning there may be 50 or 80 or 100 Jews would have come. A small group, just a caravan of maybe 20 families. Right, And from those 20 families, they then started their uh, tribal descent in Yathrib. So Allah knows best, we have no clear indication, but it seems that the Jews of Yathrib were there for around 200 years before the coming of the Prophet wasallam. And this also explains the Aws and the Khazraj, why they seem comfortable with the Yahud of Yathrib. Why? Because the Aws and the Khazraj are also from Yemen, if you remember. We talked about this. The Aws and the Khazraj are also from Yemen. They are not from uh, the Hijaz region. They have migrated up as well. So perhaps, Allah knows best, perhaps, either the Yahud came there first, and then the Aws and the Khazraj felt comfortable settling with them, and the Yahud also felt a win-win situation. We need quantity and protection. You guys knew us back in Yemen. We have some alliances and treaties, so let's continue that. Or the other way around. The Aws and Khazraj settled first, and then the Yahud of Yemen said, why don't we also have an alliance with you? So eventually the both of them are in Yathrib, and this really makes sense if we say the both of them originated from Yemen. And this is the theory that I say, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So, remind me quickly, which was the first Jewish tribe that uh, uh, had some issues and they were expelled? Who can remind me? The Banu Qaynuqa. And when was the Banu Qaynuqa expelled? When was the Banu Qaynuqa expelled? This is a quiz. You didn't know, a surprise quiz today. When was the Banu Qaynuqa expelled? Right after Badr. Right after Badr. It was expelled right after Badr in Shawwal of the second year of the Hijrah. And the reason for this was that they had given veiled threats to the Prophet ﷺ that you haven't fought real men. If you have real men, then we would have uh, won. Uh, and then the second tribe is the Banu Nadir. And the Banu Nadir took place after the Battle of Uhud. And the reason for this was they tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. I told them to sit over here, conveniently under a wall. And they went and they decided to try to assassinate him. And Jibreel came and told him to leave. And so the Banu Nadir were expelled as well. And then, uh, of course, uh, the, the last of the tribes was Banu Quraida. They were not expelled. They were in fact executed as we had mentioned and that was because of the treason during the battle of the battle of Khandaq. Okay, so with this expulsion all three of the Yehudi tribes of Medina were uh, eliminated. There was no Yehudi tribe in Medina. However, the Banu Nadir, the Banu Nadir, those that had been expelled before and also the Banu Qaynuqa, elements amongst them, they migrated to Khaybar. And Khaybar was the closest tribe, Yehudi tribe, from Medina. And especially the leaders of them, Huyay ibn Akhtab, who is the father of Safiya, who is going to become the wife of the Prophet and Salam ibn Abil Huqayq, these were very 
open and hostile enemies. They moved to Khaybar, and from Khaybar, they continued to instigate the uh, Muslims. And we know that in the battle of the uh, trench, the Yehud of Khaybar helped some of the fighters from the battle of the trench, and they were the ones who convinced the Banu Quraidah to also break the treaty. If you remember, members of the Banu Nadir, of the Banu Qaynuqa, the first two tribes, they actually traveled to Medina during the trench siege, and they made their way to the Banu Quraidah, and they were the ones who convinced them. Remember the story, right? They were the ones who convinced them that break your treaty, we will support you, don't worry, we have your back. Right? Remember that story there. And additionally, they helped one of the factions of the uh, Battle of the Trench with their arms, with their weapons, and therefore, the Prophet wasallam, as soon as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was finalized, and the threat from the Quraysh was eliminated, now he can worry about the one potential threat in his backyard. And that is the people of Khaybar. There was only one threat left in the local vicinity, and that is the people of Khaybar. And Khaybar, what is Khaybar? Khaybar is a luscious, fertile city, 230 kilometers north of Medina. So Khaybar is above Medina, whereas Mecca is south. Khaybar is north of Medina, and Khaybar sits at the top of a huge underwater river. You know there are rivers that are not underwater, but underground rivers, sorry. Uh, huge underground current that flows and so many, many of you should know this that there are actually large rivers that flow underground uh, and Khaybar and Medina both of them they actually sit on top of these huge undercurrents and Khaybar actually has far more fertile land than Medina in terms of mass Khaybar is larger but there is a smaller city they have more land but there's not that many people living there Whereas Medina has more people and the quantity of land is less. So Khaybar, uh, the name Khaybar, it is said that it, it, is, uh, it goes back to one of the uh, Amaliqa, the Amalekites, uh, that his name was Khaybar. Or another opinion says that it goes back to the Jewish name for a fortress, Khayabir, they say. I don't know, I haven't checked the Jewish or Hebrew dictionaries, excuse me. They say there's a Hebrew word for fortress, uh, Khayabir. So this is, Khaybar comes from that. Or another theory is that it actually comes from an Arabic word, uh, and uh, Khabira, and Khabir here would mean fertile. So Khaybar, that which is fertile, giving you lots of, uh, of luscious land. And Khaybar was one of the largest date-producing areas in the entire Arabian Peninsula. And it was populated only by Yehudi tribes. There were no Arab tribes in Khaybar. Khaybar was a completely Yehudi uh, area, and they had done what they had done in every other land, and that is they had built their unique fortresses. And this again shows us that most likely the Yehud of Central Arabia were from South Arabia because building fortresses is more of a South Arabian phenomenon. Whereas, uh, had they come directly from Jerusalem, how would they know how to build a fortress? Right? So again, this kind of shows us that the, the Jews of Central Arabia, of Medina, of, of Yathrib, of Khaybar, they come from South Arabia, which is Yemen, and Yemen, they have the knowledge of building dams, they have the knowledge of building fortresses, so this adds to this theory that the Yehud of Central Arabia actually are coming from Yemen. But, we had mentioned before, the Arabs had not mastered the art of building fortresses. The Yehud kept it a secret. They did not teach anybody else how to build these massive fortresses, and it was not in the custom of the Arabs, except one or two who tried to imitate them, and their fortresses were second rate. The real fortresses were built by the Yehudi tribes. And Khaybar was known in the entire Arabian Peninsula as having the biggest and the most magnificent of these fortresses. And it's not just one fortress. Rather, every mini-tribe of the Yehud had their own fortress. So we can imagine every mini-tribe of around 100, 200, 300, maybe even 500, the entire mini-town, mini-city, it is living inside this completely walled fortress. And their fortresses were walled and they were, and they were impenetrable for the Muslims who didn't have any other weapons. They didn't have, uh, uh, at the time, they did not have any major weapons to actually destroy the walls of fortresses. As we will see, that's one of the issues of Khaybar. And therefore, the Muslims realized this would be a very difficult battle. Because you are battling against a wall, a fortress. What can you do? And this is one of the reasons why Khaybar was uh, problematic. 
and we mentioned the main reason for attacking Khaybar was, frankly, it was a preemptive. There was no immediate threat from Khaybar, i.e., there was no plot coming that Khaybar is going to attack now. But Khaybar were treacherous. And Khaybar would do anything, especially the Banu Nadir people, to get back at their land in Medina. And so it was a preemptive attack so that the people of Khaybar do not launch an attack against Medina. And also, by the way, uh, you know me to be somebody who doesn't beat around the bush. I don't have any problem being politically incorrect. The fact of the matter is, this was how things worked back then. It was the survival of the fittest. Khaybar did not have any treaty with Medina. Had there been a treaty, we can maybe discuss. There is no treaty. And in those days, every single land has to be prepared. Why do you think the Yehud had a fortress in the first place? Because the whole land of Arabia was peaceful, lovey-dovey, singing kumbaya? Didn't work that way. Survival of the fittest. Every single tribe would wait for an opportunity to attack another tribe. That was the lay of the land. And people who quote this and say, oh, look at this, look at this, we say to them in response, this was how every single group did it. Muslim, Christian, Jewish, pagan, that was the law of the time. And we don't have to necessarily import, import that into our times. We firmly believe when there's a treaty, we have to abide by the treaty. And in modern times, scholars are free to derive Islamic law for 2013. But Islamic law... At this point in time, there is no treaty with the people of Khaybar. And they are completely legitimate targets. And so the Prophet ﷺ announced that he was going to uh, Khaybar. And uh, probably around 1,700 people, again, exact numbers are difficult, 1,600-1,700 people uh, marched with him to uh, Khaybar. And slight difference between when it took place. Ibn Ishaq says Khaybar took place in Muharram of the seventh year after the Hijrah. Al-Waqidi says it was Safar or Rabi' al-Awwal of the seventh year, one month apart. And this is easy to reconcile. It began in Muharram, it ended in Safar, which makes complete sense. Uh, Imam Malik and Zuhri, they said Muharram of the sixth year of the Hijrah. But this goes back to their calculation of the Hijrah. If you remember, we said some scholars considered uh, the first year of the Hijrah to be the year before the Hijrah, i.e. zero Hijrah. So in reality, what they, when they say 6AH, they mean 7 according to the standard that was later adopted. So the majority of position, Muharram 7th AH was when Khaybar took place. And this shows us that the Muslims barely rested for two weeks after Hudaybiyah. This shows us the process was thinking, what is the next step? This shows us the long-term planning of the process. And barely two weeks have gone by after they returned from Hudaybiyah and immediately he is thinking of Khaybar. Because Khaybar is the only threat in central Arabia. And the Muslims left in high spirits. All of the books of Hadith, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, they mention that when the Muslims were marching, they were so enthused, they were shouting at the top of their voices, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. They were screaming. And the Prophet ﷺ said, nas irba'u ala anfusikum. O people, be gentle with yourselves. Calm down. Relax. You're going to tire yourselves out. For verily, the one that you are calling out to is not deaf. He can hear you and he can see you and he is nearer to you than your jugular vein. Right? And another version, he said, he is with you. Wa huwa ma'akum. So Allah is with us in His knowledge. Allah hears wherever we are. So and there is no need to raise your voice that loud. And the process of March and Khaybar is 230 kilometers. So in our times it will take literally uh, 2 hours, an hour and 40 minutes by car. So it's not that far away. Uh, 230 kilometers is a, uh, not that far away. Uh, and the Prophet reached there probably in less than two days of marching and he did not stop until he was right outside the city. Or not, there was no city, excuse me. What was Khaybar? Khaybar was a bunch of fortresses. How many fortresses? The books of Sirah mention quite a lot and for sure there were others that are not mentioned. There's at least eight or nine fortresses, most likely maybe 15 fortresses and each of these fortresses is its own mini camp. And Khaybar was divided into two halves, i.e. in one have there was like six, seven, eight fortresses, and then on the other side of the plains was another six, seven, eight small fortresses, and each of these small fortresses was within visual sight of the other. So the two halves are far away, but within these two halves, so remember, what is Khaybar? Khaybar is a large land. Khaybar is many acres of green, lush land. Khaybar has lots of agricultural land in, upon which dates are being harvested. And within this land, the, the land had basically two halves. On one half you had 
a number of fortresses within visual distance and then on the other half we don't know the exact distance between these two halves but we can imagine it's going to be a few hours marching there was going to be uh, other of these fortresses and when the Prophet ﷺ came to Khaybar it was a complete surprise for the people of Khaybar they were not expecting in the slightest anything to happen immediately and Sahih Bukhari informs us in a number of books that the Prophet ﷺ intentionally camped the night away from Khaybar. So they, they started marching before Fajr to completely surprise them. And when they finally came within the distance of the first uh, camp or the first fortress, they saw the people exiting the fortress uh, with their uh, plows and with their axes and with their tools to go to the farm, to go to the agricultural, you know, uh, to take care of their fields uh, with the, you know, uh, uh, all of the instruments that is needed for harvesting. And when they saw the Muslims, they abandoned their uh, instruments and they rushed back running, calling out that Muhammad and his army has arrived, Muhammad and his army has arrived. Now pause here. The very fact that they say this shows that even though they're surprised, it's not a complete surprise. They knew that they had crossed some boundaries and that if anybody is going to attack them, it is going to be the Prophet and the armies. So they yelled out that Muhammad has arrived, Muhammad has arrived. And this clearly shows they were dreading. They had this premonition because they have done something they shouldn't have done. And they know there is a threat from the Muslims. And so when the Prophet ﷺ came, so then he, they ran inside and they closed the doors and they sealed it. And here is when the Prophet ﷺ uttered his famous lines, which are mentioned in every book of Sirah and every book of Hadith. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Kharibat Khaybar. Uh, uh, that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, uh, Khaybar has been destroyed. Uh, and whenever we arrive at the border of a land or a country or a people, then what an evil morning, what an evil morning it is for those that have been warned. In other words, they're in for some tough times now. And the Prophet is saying, Khaybar, Khaybar, Khaybar has been now destroyed. It will be destroyed. And the books of Sirah basically mention a bunch of incidents as usual. We have to piece them together. And what we piece together is the following. That the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they conquered one fortress at a time. They con because now what's happened, all of the tribes have locked themselves up. All of them have basically sought protection in their own unique fortresses. And perhaps this was one of the reasons for downfall. That in their ingenuity, they never thought... What if an army comes straight to our land? We will not be able to help one another. And each group will have to face the entire army, which is exactly what happened. That no doubt if a small raiding party would come, these fortresses would help. But what if an army would come? 17, 1800 people, maybe even 2000 people. Each of these mini fortresses would not have more than 500 max men. Max 500, maybe even two, 300 some of them. You're not going to be able to fight that army. So in their ingenuity, they had a gaping hole in their construction of these fortresses. And that is, they could not unite to fight against an army. And in this was their downfall. So the Prophet ﷺ kept on targeting one fortress after another. And some of the names of these fortresses have been preserved so they would name their fortresses Abu, uh, Abu Nizar As-Sa'ab fortress Abu Nizar fortress uh, one of the fortresses uh, Na'im Na'im was one of the largest fortresses and the Muslims fought 10 days and they threw arrows and they did whatever they could and Abu Bakr took charge for a few days then Umar took charge and for 10 days they fought and one of the famous Sahaba Mahmud ibn Maslam al-Ansari uh, he died he died a shaheed when the people of the fortress they threw a large log so you know one of the, one of the tactics of the people of the fortress is you throw things you know you've all seen these movies where they have things they throw bo boiling oil, they throw that, uh, they have slits for the arrows, uh, they throw heavy objects, so this is all a part of the tactics of the fortress. And the Muslims did not ever encounter this before in Mecca, in Medina, this is something that is new for them, and they did not quite know what to do. Uh, Mahmud ibn Maslam al-Ansari, one of the Ansar, uh, he came too close to the edge, and they threw a large 
log onto him and they squashed him to death and he died a shaheed. And this was very demoralizing uh, to see the death of Mahmud in this manner. And so the Sahaba for 10 days were battling this one fortress, an naim and where they went to sleep that night and the Prophet after Salat al-Isha, he made an announcement. He said that tomorrow at Salat al-Fajr, I will hand the banner to someone whom Allah and His Messenger love. And Allah will grant us victory at His hands. So he made a prediction that tomorrow morning I will hand the flag to someone whom Allah and His Messenger love. And he will be the one at His hands we will have victory. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, never in my life did I wish to become a leader like I did on that night. That was the one night of my life I desired to be a leader more than any other night. Because this is a great victory for Islam. And in the morning, the Prophet ﷺ prayed Fajr, everybody's excited. He turned around and he said, Aina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? And so they said, he has some problem with the eyes and he cannot open his eyes so he has remained in his tent. He had some infection of the eyes. He's remaining in his tent. So the Prophet said, bring him to me. And so when Ali ibn Abi Talib came, the Prophet spat into his eyes and he became cured. And he then handed the raya or the banner to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imdi Bismillah, go forth and in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep on going and do not turn back. In other words, be firm, be resolute, and you will be the victor. And this was a great blessing for Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is a great blessing for Ali ibn Abi Talib that uh, he was told by the Prophet to be the commander at whose hands the victory would take place. And he came forth with the banner and then he paused. And he wanted to ask a question. But the Prophet had told him, go forth and don't turn back. And he wanted to ask a question. So he paused where he was, and instead of turning around, because that would have been turning back, he shouted at the top of his lungs, Ya Rasulullah, what conditions should I give them when I get there? He doesn't want to turn around because that would be disobeying. Because the Prophet said, go forth in the name of Allah and do not turn back. And so he shouts out, what are the conditions I should be placing upon them? And so the Prophet said, Fight them until they testify La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. If they do so, then their lives and their properties are protected from you and me from and their affair is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For by Allah, if Allah guides through you even one person, then it is better than a million dollars, a herd of camels, we have translated this a million dollars, a whole herd of camels, it is better for you than one person be guided uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows us that the ultimate goal of these types of expeditions is not killing, nor is it Islamic land and conquest. It is inviting others to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is the process I'm telling Ali ibn Abi Talib at the time when after 10 days of fighting against an naim and fighting against this tribe, what does he tell Ali ibn Abi Talib? Call them to la ilaha illallah before you begin fighting. And if they agree, then stop fighting. And their property is theirs. And their money is theirs. Because by Allah, if one person is guided to Islam through you, that is better than a whole herd of camels. And this clearly illustrates the Islamic psychology behind these expeditions and conquests. What was it? Money, wealth, fame, fortune, nothing. It was da'wah, inviting people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib went with a contingent and the chieftain of this fortress, his name was Mirhab and uh, whatever happened on that day, we don't know the details other than Mirhab felt uh, bold enough to challenge the Muslims to a duel. And so Mirhab went out of the fortress and he was known to be a ferocious warrior and firstly, Amir ibn al-Aqwa, one of the Ansar, took on the challenge but Mirhab managed to cut him off and Amir died a shaheed in the battle. And the next person to take up was Ali himself. Even though generally speaking, the, even though he's the leader, he should not technically be the one doing this, but he wanted to take charge. And so Ali ibn Abi Talib 
took on Mirhab in the duel before the battle and he managed to get rid of him. He managed to kill Mirhab. And this was a, one of the biggest and the first victories for the Muslims and a huge demoralization factor for the uh, tribe because this was like the first major loss of Khaybar. The first major issue of Khaybar that their chieftain uh, dies and eventually the people came out to actually fight the Muslims and they uh, fought a severe fighting. That's what's going to happen when you're trapped into a wall, you're trapped into a fortress, but the Muslims eventually overcame. It was during this expedition where the famous story takes place that all of us have heard when we were children and it is uh, a story mentioned in a number of books of Sirah that uh, one of the uh, commanders of the tribe, of the Yehudi tribe, he managed to knock out the, the, the shield of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali was left defenseless. And he then went to the wall of the fortress. And the wall of the fortress we all have seen in movies. These are massive structures. This is not something you pick up with one hand. He went to the wall of the fortress and unhinged it. And he used that entire wall. Uh, the, the entire door, excuse me, the entire door of the fortress. He used that door as a shield for the remainder of the battle. And then when the battle was over, he threw it aside. And Abu Rafi', the narrator, he says, after that uh, incident, seven of us, we looked at that door and we tried to pick it up, but we were not able to pick it up. Seven of us, we tried to pick up that door, we were not able to pick it up. And there is no doubt this is a karama, this is a, um, a mini miracle that was given to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we are the true followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We give him every credit where it is due. And we do not be miserly or stingy in giving him any credit that Allah and his messenger have given him. Ali ibn Abi Talib was a man who Allah loved and whom the messenger loved. And he loved Allah and he loved the messenger. And he was of the greatest of the Sahaba. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ala alil bayti ajma'in. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he uh, showed us his bravery in the battle of Khaybar. This was the conquest of a Na'im. When a Na'im was conquest, they moved on to that was conquered they moved on to the next uh, the next um, fortress and that is called a saab and a saab took them three days to conquer and it was a great miracle from Allah that they conquered it because their food supply had basically dwindled to nothing and they didn't have anything left and when they conquered a saab Amazingly, this entire fortress was stockpiled with grain, with lots of food for the Muslims, and so they used this food for the remainder of their duration over there. And it was stockpiled with water, uh, with all of the food that they needed, so the entire army lived off of this food for the remainder of the Battle of Khaybar. A number of stories are mentioned here as well uh, in the Battle of Khaybar. Of them uh, is the story of the slave who came to the Prophet wasallam, and he had heard that there is a man with a new religion and he's claiming to be a prophet and he was a slave of the uh, Yahud, he was a slave of the people of Khaybar. So he comes to the Prophet and he says, what are you about? So the Prophet said, Ana Nabi, I'm a prophet. So he said, what is a prophet? What have you come with? So the Prophet explained to him what is Islam. And when he heard this, the slave accepted Islam right then and there. And he said, my master has sent me to graze the flock. What do I do with these flock? So the Prophet ﷺ said, you must return it to the master. Because it's not permissible for us to take this. You, your master gave it to you as an amana. You have to go return it. And so the Prophet ﷺ rubbed the heads of the sheep and told the slave, go to such and such a place and the sheep will return to their master automatically. Otherwise, the sheep will not return to the master. But the process and basically, yeah, and he made dua and with the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the slave went to a certain place. He let the sheep go. The sheep returned to the master. And the slave came back to the army. We don't even know his name. We have no idea who he is. And he fought and fought until a stray arrow killed him. And the Prophet stood over his body. And because he was a slave, he possessed nothing. And he only had a loincloth, you know, that's all he had, just covering his aura. And as he was standing over the body, uh, waiting for the burial, uh, this is after the battle is over, they're burying him, then the Prophet ﷺ turned away his eyes and closed his eyes. And they said, uh, what is the matter, O, o Messenger of Allah? And he said, his two Hurun'een have come to greet him. His two Hurun'een have come to greet him. And this was why they, he lowered his eyes. And this was a man who never did one sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but 
There was no need for sajda because there was no time for salah. He accepted Islam, he died later on in the day, and this is a number of cases. In the battle of Uhud we also mentioned someone, uh, here we also mentioned somebody. So in the seerah we have a few cases of people who accepted Islam and they die before praying even one prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's because the time uh, never came for salah. Otherwise, as we know, praying is a part of Islam. Now, what is really interesting here is the meticulous honesty of the Prophet ﷺ in rejecting the sheep, saying the sheep cannot belong to me, even though he is at war with this nation. Why? Because if you want it, you have to conquer it properly. And this slave, it was not his right to hand over the sheep to the Prophet ﷺ, because the slave has been given an amana by the master. And had the Muslims conquered the master, then the master and his sheep are theirs. Correct? But this is not the way to go about doing it. So the Prophet ﷺ returned all of the sheep to the master, even though the irony is he's actually fighting the master in war. But this is not how you capture the property. And this shows us the high standards that Islam has placed for uh, acquiring property, for uh, the honesty in, 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 in trading and in transaction. Another story is also mentioned, and this story is actually, scholars differ, is this the same story that people mistook in, in the Battle of Khaybar, or is it two different stories because we find the same story in a number of battles. Uh, at least two different battles we find the same type of story. So Allah knows whether it is one battle and the narrators got confused and some said this, some said that, or did the same rough incident occur in multiple battles, Allah knows best. But it is uh, authentically mentioned in Sahih Bukhari even that this occurred in the battle of Khaybar. And that is the famous story of the Bedouin who was fighting a mighty fight and the people are impressed. And the people say, this is a man of Jannah walking on earth. This is a man from Jannah. And when they came to the Prophet and said, this is a man from Jannah, the Prophet said, no, rather he is a man from Jahannam. And the Sahaba said, if this is a man who's going to go to Jahannam, and he's fighting the way he's fighting, who amongst us can go to Jannah? And one of the Sahaba said, I'm going to follow him, find out what the deal is. Why is he from Jahannam? And he followed him until an arrow gla uh, glazed him, it, it uh, cut his hand, it injured his hand, and when he saw that his hand was no longer usable, so he then took his sword, put it on the ground, and then jumped onto the sword to commit suicide. So the reason he was fighting was to basically be called powerful and mighty. He wasn't really fighting fi sabirillah. He was fighting for his ego and honor. And people have different reasons why they want to die. For us in this world that we live in, in this time and place, this is not, it's very difficult to imagine. But for those who have uh, been to war or, or they have been in battle, they understand this type of mentality. That you want a legacy, you want people to talk about you, you want people to establish your fame, that I am this and I am that, and that was his niyyah. His niyyah was not fi sabidillah. When he realized he couldn't fight anymore, khalas, I don't want to be, you know, uh, you know uh, not being able to fight. And he then committed suicide. And so the man who was following him went back to the Prophet and said that Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka rasulullah. And the Prophet said, "What is the matter? We know you're a Muslim. You're not accepting Islam again. What is the mus what is the matter?" So he explained to him what had happened, and the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, it is possible that a person does deeds that appear in the eyes of the people to be deeds of the people of Jahannam. Uh, sorry, people of Jannah. But eventually, Qadr catches up to him and he dies while doing a deed of the fire of hell. And it is possible a person appears to be an evil person doing the deeds of the people of Jahannam. But Qadr catches up to him and he does the deeds of the people of Jannah and then he enters Jannah. And this shows us, very simple point, we all know this, that Al-A'malu Bil Khawatim. Allah judges us depending on the end of our lives. What do we die? What state do we die in? That is what will be the ultimate uh, judge. And here was a man, he died in an evil state and therefore his end is evil. Uh, eventually they kept on conquering conquer, uh, fortress after fortress. Uh, eventually they came to another that is called the fortress of uh, the castle of Zubayr it is called. And this fortress did not have its own internal well. But rather it was fed by an external water supply. And so the Muslims blocked up the water supply. 
so that the men had to come out and fight and eventually when they fought uh, they were defeated and with the defeat of the fortress of Az-Zubayr the one half of Khaybar was conquered all of those other uh, fortresses were conquered and the other half remained and so the Prophet and the Sahaba, they crossed over to the other side of Khaybar and they began another series of mini conquests. So remember, Khaybar was not a simple battle. Khaybar was a series of battles, at least nine battles, at least eight or nine battles, some of which lasted 10 days, some of which lasted one day, some of which lasted three days. So all of these battles are taking place. They then cross over to the other side and in the same manner they engage one, two, three, and at least three battles we know of in the seerah, very similar that they are fought until finally, and by the way, every time one fortress falls, so the group of fighters there, they run over to another fortress because they're running for protection. So every time they're running, more and more groups gather in the remaining fortress. Because as soon as they surrender, they're not going to surrender. They're going to be people that run on horse. They're going to run to the other fortress. And so they gain protection over there. Eventually, there was one of the largest uh, fortresses left. And all of the many tribes that had anybody still alive was now living in that large fortress. And so the Prophet and the Muslims just camped outside and they waited because this fortress was too big for them. And a solid two weeks went by until finally the people inside realized there's nothing we can do. There's no place to run. We cannot run. We cannot hide. And so they negotiated a surrender. They negotiated a surrender. And here is where a lot of scholars differ in the past. Was Khaybar a conquest or was it a surrender? Why does it matter? Well, firstly, there's fiqh differences that are beyond the scope of this class. If it's conquered and if it's surrendered, there are slight fiqh differences. Secondly, it's a matter of prestige or honor for the Muslims and it's a matter of humiliation for the, the group that is conquered. If the group that is conquered surrendered willingly, they gain some izzah. And if they were forced and if they were militarily conquered, then this is humiliation, right? So it's a matter really of history and a little bit of fiqh, and scholars differ. Why do they differ? Because what the confusion of Khaybar is, they fought so many battles, but right at the end, the final big fortress, they negotiated a surrender. So is it an, uh, an actual surrender that they waved the white flag? Or did, were they conquered? In, in our terms, wave the white flag, you get the point here, right? Did they wave the white flag metaphorically? Or were they conquered? And scholars have differed, and the majority position, and Ibn Qayyim uh, mentions this in his Zad, and other great scholars, is that they were conquered. And the evidence for this is the fact that had they wanted to surrender, they would have surrendered from the very beginning. The fact that one after the other, every single one of the fortresses was conquered and it was just a matter of time when they would have done this one as well. And they realized this, that we we're going to be conquered, so let's negotiate some type of, uh, some type of treaty. And so they worked out a treaty. Initially, they, the process wanted to expel them, but they argued, they petitioned, and they said that Ya Abu al-Qasim, they're not going to call him Rasulullah, Ya Abu al-Qasim, your people do not know how to operate these lands or man these lands or, or maximize production of these lands. And we are people that we know Khaybar inside out. So why don't we agree to a percentage? You let us stay here and we'll give you a percentage. And so back and forth they went until finally the conditions were worked out that uh, number one, that the people of Khaybar would give 50% of their produce to the Muslims. Now the people of Khaybar had hundreds of acres of land and 50% is a massive amount. It is a fortune. We're talking about tens of millions, maybe even a hundred million. This is equivalent. Tens of millions is going to be the biggest amount of money they have ever seen, the Muslim community. 50% of Khaybar will come to the Muslims. Number two, that the maintenance and the pro cost and the labor is going to be not 50-50, 100% you. We don't have any maintenance or labor, any costs associated with the land, that's your business, not ours. And then the third condition, this treaty is in effect for as long as we want it to be in effect. We can cancel when we want to cancel. There is no full long-term treaty. This is a temporary treaty and we can cancel it at any time. 
If you agree to these conditions, you can remain. And so the people of Khaybar decided to remain with these uh, conditions. And in fact, this shows us the foresight of the Prophet ﷺ to allow them to reign. Because the fact of the matter is that the Muslims, they neither had the experience nor even the manpower at this point in time to leave 300, 400 people at Khaybar. Khaybar would need more than that. Khaybar would need like a thousand people to take care of it. And at this point in time, the Muslims don't have a thousand people to spare. Additionally, the people of Khaybar know Khaybar better. Let them take care of it and we get a massive fortune in return. And this is exactly what happened, that they continued to send their money to the Muslims until towards the end of the Khilaf of Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab, now that Islam had expanded and there were so many Muslims around the entire Islamic Republic, there is no need now for anybody else to man this. And so he said to them, according to the conditions, you know, whenever we want to break it, we're going to break it. And so you have to choose another land to live in. So they were sent to other lands uh, and they were told to leave at a, after a particular date. And that was the end of the Yahudi presence in Central uh, Arabia. So after these negotiations are taking place, at one point in time, we don't know when, the books of Sira simply mention the famous incident, again, we all know of it since we are children, since we have children, we heard this story, and that is the poisoning or the attempted poisoning of the Prophet wasallam. After these negotiations, some food was gifted to the Prophet wasallam, uh, and it was cooked, later on we find out, by the wife of one of the leaders that had been killed. Later on we find out. Now when the food is gifted, they don't know. So one of the tribes gives delicacies, foods, and we can imagine the people of Khaybar being who they are. They have a different cuisine, and they have some exotic foods, and they have some different you know, ways of cooking it, and no doubt they would have decorated it and made it like a massive gift. And it is understood that when a person has conquered and now this is the leader, so you show some honor to him. So it's not surprising that any people would try to appease the new leader by sending a beautiful gift. And so they sent him a lavish food item, massive tray full of meat and other items, whatever their cuisine will be. We don't know what their cuisine was. And we know now later on that the woman who cooked this, she asked around what meat does the Prophet like the most? And she was told that he loves the shoulder blade of a lamb. This was the favorite meat of the Prophet the shoulder point of a lamb. And so she put poison in the whole lamb, but especially, especially in the upper shank or the shoulder blade. That's where she concentrated this uh, poison. And in fact, some of the books of Sira mention the name of this poison as well, but uh, there's no point in me mentioning the Arabic name. It's something long gone, the recipe for this poison. But it was a very, very potent poison. It was a very powerful poison. And we know this because of exactly what happened. When the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba sat down to eat, the Prophet ﷺ put a bite in his mouth. And as soon as he put it in his mouth, he said, everybody stop eating. Everybody stop eating. He said that, but unfortunately, one Sahabi by the name of Bishr ibn al-Barra had already eaten. And it was too late for him. And the Prophet said, everybody stop eating. The shoulder of the lamb has told me that it has been poisoned. In other words, the lamb is speaking to me in this meat. The shoulder is speaking to, excuse me. It has told me that it has been poisoned. So obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the meat to speak to the Prophet So the Prophet did not swallow, but he put it in his mouth. And as for Bishr, it appears he swallowed a little bit. And Bishr fell ill, fell severely ill. A number of other Sahaba, they spat out the, uh, the, the, the meat before they swallowed, so they had to be treated. And they, by and large, lived. The Prophet wasallam, as a result of this poison, he felt a pain. And he felt the effects of this poison for the rest of his life. For the rest of his four years. He has now four years left to live. For the rest of his life. So much so that on his deathbed, when he has a week left or a few days left, he will mention to Aisha that, O oh Aisha, I can still feel the effects of that poison from the Yahudiya of Khaybar. I feel it in my heart arteries and I feel that now is the time the poison has finally reached my heart. Now, 
his death was written, but the poison was one of the causes that made that death more painful. He's still feeling, he says to Aisha, I can still feel the pain of that poison to this day. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, asked for Bishr, he eventually died in a few days. Right now he's sick, he's vomiting, whatnot. After a few days he dies. So the Prophet ﷺ called the tribe that had gifted him this meat. And he challenged them, he said, if I ask you anything, you promise to tell me the truth. They said, yes, we tell you the truth. So he said, who is your ancestor? Who is your communal ancestor, the one that you ascribe to? So they mentioned a name so-and-so. The books of Sirah don't mention. So the Prophet said, you are lying. Your ancestor is so-and-so. Meaning he's proving to them, I know what you do not know. And Allah has taught me what you are telling me is true or not. So they said, you have, you know, whatever this, we don't know why they mention another name. Perhaps there was some point of embarrassment about this person, so they substituted him for another person. Allah knows the reason, we don't know. But they said a lie. They said, our ancestor is so-and-so. And the Prophet said, no, your real ancestor is so-and-so. They know who the ancestor is. So they said, Sadaqta ya Abul Qasim, you have spoken the truth, you have, uh, you know, you have been honest with us, so you know yani, who our ancestor is. So then he asked them again, so if I ask you a question, will you be honest with me? You already showed me you're lying. Will you be honest with me? So they said, Ya Abul Qasim, you already see now that if we lie, you can tell, so there's no reason for us to lie, we will be honest with you. We will be honest with you. So he asked him a second question. Who is going to the fire of hell? Another trick question. Are you honest with me or not? So they said, We will go for a short period of time. But then Allah will save us. And you and your people will remain forever. Now this was their belief. Allah says it in the Quran. Right? Allah says in Surah Baqarah, وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا we're only going to be there for a while. We're, they said basically, we know we're sinful. We know we haven't lived up to the laws of the Torah. So we're going to be punished for a while. Then we're going to move on. You guys will stay there forever. So the Prophet ﷺ said, اِخْسَأُوا فِيهَا Remain humiliated and, 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 and basically اِخْسَأُوا also means to shut up basically. اِخْسَأُوا فِيهَا Remain in the fire of hell. And wallahi, by Allah, we will not remain after you. You're, this is only for you basically, right? We are not going to be the ones that come after you in that place. So now I will ask you a third question. Will you tell me the truth? And they said, we will say the truth. So he said, did you poison the lamb? Did you poison, sorry, the goat. Did you poison the goat? And they said, yes, we did. And perhaps it was their honesty that saved them from all being killed. Allah knows best. Because they were not all killed. Perhaps it was this honesty. They said, yes, we did. So he said, why would you do that? So they said, well, if you are a liar in your claim to be a prophet, we would be free of you and your conquering. And if you are a prophet, then our mischievousness would not have harmed you anyway. This is their mentality, basically. Right? Either way, how can you get angry at us? If you're a liar, well then, we would have gotten rid of you. And if you're not a liar, then no matter what we did, you would not have been harmed. You see, you're still alive basically, right? Now look at the arrogance here. They see that the Prophet has been saved, but it doesn't affect them. And as Allah says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They recognize clearly, just like they recognize their own children. But it is a matter of pride and uh, prestige. And so uh, they admitted that they had poisoned. And they said it was so and so. The lady, she was the cook that did it. So he called for the lady. And he said to her, why did you do this? And uh, in some books of Sirah it is mentioned that uh, you killed my husband and you killed my uncle and so and so. They all died in the battle. So I wanted to kill you as a result. So she was honest. That this is revenge. You did this, I'm going to do this back to you. And uh, some of the Sahaba uh, said to execute her because obviously this is what she uh, deserves. Now here is where the riwayat differ because some riwayat say <clears throat> that he did forgive her and some riwayat mentioned that she was killed. And so uh, scholars have tried to reconcile all of this and Ibn al-Qayyim basically as usual, Ibn al-Qayyim the master of Sirah comes along and he finds the way through and he says, the Prophet forgave her for what she had done to him. 
But after a few days when Bishr died, she had to be killed for Qisas. Because she killed Bishr, the other Sahabi that died from the poison. So the haqq of the Prophet he forgave her. And he did not retaliate for himself. But when Bishr died, and Bishr died after a few days at Khaybar, so then it is not fair for Bishr that Bishr's death goes unavenged. And so he had to do the Qisas on behalf of Bishr, and so the lady was eventually uh, executed. Now eventually, so the, the, all of the mini fortresses of Khaybar uh, were conquered, and all of the Muslims who participated in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah were given extra shares. Why? Because Allah had promised them this in the Quran. Surah Al-Fatih. وَعَدَكُمُ اللَّهُ مَغَانِمَ كَثِيرًا تَأْخُذُونَهَا فَعَجَّلَ لَكُمْ هَادِهِ Allah has promised you, you will gain a lot of ghanima. Right? And Allah says in the Quran that this is something that you have been promised. فَعَجَّلَ لَكُمْ Allah has expedited, made it fast for you. What? Your reward in Jannah, Allah has given you a bit of it in this world. فَعَجَّلَ لَكُمْ هَادِهِ Some of your rewards up there, you're getting it now. For your patience in the battle of Khayb, uh, in the battle of, uh, in the treaty of Hudaybiyyah. Your sabr, your patience, your iman in the treaty of Hudaybiyyah, Allah is saying, you will get a massive victory. And so, every single person who participated in Hudaybiyyah was given massive shares out of the uh, incident of uh, Khaybar. And another major incident happened uh, that was a great cause of joy. And that was that while the Muslims were still at Khaybar, and the Prophet ﷺ has finished the negotiations and he has just conquered all of Khaybar on the same day. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib makes his way to Khaybar. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib has now returned from Abyssinia with around 50 or so Muslim men and women. He has come from Abyssinia and he has been gone for over a decade. Because it is now the seventh year of the Hijrah. It is now the seventh year of the Hijrah. And they went to Abyssinia perhaps in the fifth year. Perhaps, we don't know exact dates. Uh, not of the Hijrah, of the Da'wah. Sixth year of the Da'wah, right? Maximum would have been seventh year of the Da'wah. They would have been, been to Abyssinia. So at least a decade, maybe more than a decade, the Prophet has not seen one of his best friends and one of his most beloved cousins. Now remember, Ja'far is older than Ali. Ali is a young child, the Prophet is raising him. Ja'far is much older, and the Prophet has a very different relationship with Ja'far than he has with Ali. And Ja'far was very beloved to our Prophet ﷺ. And when he saw Ja'far, he stood up to greet him, and he kissed him on the forehead. Our Prophet kissed Ja'far on the forehead. And he said, I don't know which of the two things is making me happier today. Fathu Khaybar, or the return of Ja'far. Which of the two things is making me happier? That I'm so happy to see Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, that he's saying, I don't know which of the two is making me happier. I conquered all of Khaybar. Now, wallahi, imagine this, a whole month of battles, and the biggest conquest in terms of uh, monetary conquest since the beginning. Yet his joy, he is saying, I don't know which is making me happier today. Fathu Khaybar or Ruju'u Ja'far. These two have come to me on the same uh, day. And subhanAllah, even though the people from Habasha, the Muslims, did not participate at Khaybar, they all got a share as well in Khaybar. And this is an amazing, amazing blessing for them. It shows us that Allah Azza wa Jal never ignores the sacrifice of those who have sacrificed. Because their hardships were hardships that no Muslims ever had to endure at the time of the Prophet Their hardships of emigrating to a foreign land, a foreign place, learning a new language, new culture, new civilization, whole different ballpark if you like. And Allah knows what has happened and as we know one of the biggest losses in my opinion the details of Abyssinia we really don't know who's going to preserve it for us you know just have tidbits here and there but more than a decade of harsh living civil war has taken place we know that there was a civil war in Abyssinia they were almost going to be expelled that the other king uh, Najashi was on their side Najashi's nephew was against them 
And Najashi had, uh, I mentioned this back in the Najashi, was it two years ago, whenever, I said that uh, Najashi actually had prepared a secret ship for them. And he says, if my nephew kills me, you go to this place and there's a ship waiting just for you. This is what Najashi is thinking of when he's about to die. Even though Allah saved him. And when Allah saved him, the Muslims are so happy that Allah has saved Najashi against his enemy, right? So all of this is happening. And here is a group of Muslims that did not participate in Khaybar. And yet, because of their sacrifices, they all got a massive amount of reward in this dunya because of what they have undergone. And there's a beautiful hadith here. Let me just ta go into a tangent before we come back to Khaybar. Beautiful hadith here that when they returned to Medina, so Asma binti Umais, one of those who had emigrated to uh, Abyssinia, Asma bint Umais from Mecca, all of the people in Abyssinia are Meccan, obviously there are no Ansari in Abyssinia, right? Because Abyssinia takes place from Mecca. Asma bint Umais, uh, when she comes for the first time to Medina, so after a day or two she visits her friend Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet Wasallam. And when she visits Hafsa, her friend that she hasn't seen for 10-15 years, then Umar ibn al-Khattab comes back and she asks Hafsa, uh, he asks Hafsa, who is this lady? with you. And Asma says, this is Asma binti Umais. So Umar says, binti Umais, of course he knows Umais her father. Binti Umais, you are the Habashiya, you are the seafaring lady. So he's being a bit sarcastic. The Habashiya lady, the seafaring, the one, the ocean lady. Then he says that, we have more right to the Prophet than you. Because we emigrated to Medina with him. So he's just semi-teasing her. Like, we have more right than you to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we have beaten you in emigrating to Medina. You guys are coming after seven years. We've been here now seven years in Medina. Asma snapped. All of this frustration and anger just snapped at Umar. And she said, La Wallahi, you have no more right for the Prophet Sallallahu You were at least with him for all of these ten years. He would console you at times of grief. He would feed you when you were hungry. He would guide you when you were mistaken. And we suffered, and we toiled, and we were in a strange land with nobody. Wallahi, I'm not going to eat or drink until I go to the Prophet and tell him exactly what you said, and see for yourself who's right or wrong. And so right then and there, she went to the masjid of the Prophet in front of everybody, all the Sahaba, and she started ra ra ranting about Umar ibn Khattab that, Ya Rasulullah, Umar said this and this, and I said, I'm not going to eat and drink until I come straight to you, and I say exactly what he said. And so the Prophet ﷺ said that he does not have any more right over us than you. Go back and tell him, he made one hijrah, you people made two hijras. You made the Hijrah to Abyssinia basically, and then from Abyssinia you made the Hijrah to Medina, you have double Hijrah, they only have one Hijrah. And so she went back flaunting this hadith, that look, I told you so, right? And she and the news spread like wildfire to all of the Muslims who had emigrated from, from Abyssinia, and the whole day went by, and all of the Abyssinian Muslims, the ones who had emigr emigrated, are coming to the house of Asma, wanting to hear directly the details, because they want now, right? They want to hear directly from uh, Asma what happened and what did the Prophet say and the riwayah goes they, they were never happier than they were on that day when the Prophet said that they have more right than Umar because they did two hijras and Umar did one a hijra so this shows us they also had their reward of course um, all of this happiness is going to be tempered very shortly by the death of Ja'far very soon. And the death of Ja'far was a very tragic event for the Prophet ﷺ and we will come to that when we come to that. So the, the, the conquest of Khaybar was indeed a very huge demoralizing factor for the people of Quraysh. Because Khaybar was known to be the most fertile and the most protected and the most uh, monetary, if you like, area of all of the Arabian Peninsula. And now it is in the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. This is money making. There's a lot of money, a lot of power. And it was also the most impenetrable fortress. And yet the Prophet ﷺ conquered it. And it was a huge demoralizing factor for the Quraysh. And of course when they conquered Khaybar, they conquered some smaller uh, cities and tribes that were around Khaybar as well. There are places called Wadil Qura and others and they all agree to the same conditions. You guys stay here, we will give you 50% and one other incident happened at Khaybar uh, that was the uh, people of Fadak and the people of Fadak were a smaller tribe, a smaller area, not as large as Khaybar and the people of Fadak, uh, they became scared 
that what if the Muslims come here? So without any army, without any threat, without any people marching, the people of Fadak sent their letter to the Prophet ﷺ that we also agree to the exact same conditions. And the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba had never stepped foot in Fadak and there was no intention to go to Fadak. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ accepted this and uh, the lands of Fadak, the small lands of Fadak, they were a special gift by Allah to the Prophet ﷺ directly. Because there was no army that went there, there was no groups of Sahaba that fought there, it was a, a, a privilege or a blessing that the Prophet ﷺ gave to, uh, sorry, Allah gave directly to the Prophet ﷺ, and so the lands of Fadak were uh, gifted, if you like, by Allah directly to the Prophet ﷺ, and he would use the proceeds of Fadak to take care of his uh, family. And Khaybar generated more wealth than anything the Muslims had ever seen. And in terms of land, in terms of land, Khaybar was the largest conquest in the history of the Prophet. ﷺ. In terms of money, maybe Hunayn was bigger. Maybe. We don't know exactly. We don't have figures. But Hunayn did not have much land. Hunayn had other types of wealth. In terms of land, there is no competition. The largest, and frankly, land is always more expensive than material possession. The largest conquest in the history of Islam for the Prophet ﷺ in terms of lands to be acquired by the Muslims and the most priciest lands was Khaybar. And it wasn't just lands, of course lands is the most, but they had food, all of these fortresses had their grains, they had armor, they had weapons, they had animals, they had slaves. All of this was given over to the Muslims and it was at this point in time that the Muhajirun returned to the Ansar, the lands that the Ansar had given the Muhajirun in the first year of the Hijrah. Rewind, go back six years. When the Muhajirun came, what did the Ansar do? They gave, they gave, they gave. And the Muhajirun always felt that this is not ours. Now that they got land, they returned to the Ansar, the original land that had been gifted to them. And Ibn Umar says, we never ate to our fill until after Khaybar. Ibn Umar is a Muhajir, his father is Umar ibn Khattab. We never ate to our fill until after Khaybar. And of course, Good things always come to those who wait. Allah's reward will always come for those who are patient. For so many years the people toiled and struggled. Some of these have been Muslim now for 20 years from the beginning of Mecca. And eventually every one of the Muhajirun, every one of them, he now gets a lifelong fortune. Because it's going to be given to him every year. Every year the produce is going to come without lifting a finger. He gets a massive amount and that is enough to take care of him and his family. And this is of course what we expect from uh, anybody who sacrifices for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will give him in this dunya before the akhirah. And one final point that we were not going to go into detail now. Uh, inshallah maybe next week we'll go into uh, the details of this. And that is that uh, in this time a number of marriages have taken place of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We skipped over uh, one of the most... Um, controversial or, or hot topics and that is the marriage of Zainab bint Jahsh and I'm still wondering when and how to squeeze that in whether we should wait till the end or actually we, are, we already skipped over so I guess we'll have to wait to the end for that one uh, but that is one of the uh, most difficult stories of the seerah uh, for non-Muslims to basically smear our process and that's why it's very difficult for us to uh, to mention this uh, in this gathering um, the problem comes, have we been in Muslim lands? We can just gloss over it and say, we don't care about the other versions. Let's talk about one version. But just like the satanic verses, I can close my ears, but I cannot close your ears. Other people say things. Non-Muslims say things. And I'd rather you hear it from me, and we try to explain it, than you hear it from somebody else and you don't know how to defend. Right, so that's really why that topic is very awkward because there are reports that are different than the standard accounts. There's two or three accounts. Just like remember the satanic verses. Remember there are three accounts there. One of them is very, very evil and the other one is understandable and the other one is very trivial. So we have to explain. And the same thing happens in the story of Zainab that there are some uh, claims that are made and sometimes those claims are not nice for us to hear. But I'd rather we discuss it in an academic fashion and then respond to it uh, and how that will be done, I still <laughs> don't know. But inshallah, we'll get to there. Uh, so the, uh, the marriage of Zainab bint Jahsh, we have glossed over. Uh, we talked about very briefly, briefly about, uh, uh, or I don't remember, I think we did about Rayhana. Did we talk about Rayhana from the Banu Qurayda? 
We talked about Rayhana from the Banu Qurayza, uh, that the Prophet married her, and she probably died in his lifetime, one of his two wives to die in his lifetime. Uh, the other marriage that, no need to talk into a lot of detail, is a very simple marriage uh, that took place probably a month before Khaybar, maybe even after Hudaybiyah, maybe right before Hudaybiyah. J basically, around this time, two marriages take place. Around this time, two marriages take place. One of them, the first of them, is the marriage of uh, Ramla uh, binti Abi Sufyan, Umm Habiba. She is Ramla binti Abi Sufyan, and uh, of course the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And her husband uh, was in Abyssinia, and she became a widow in Abyssinia, and she had nobody in Abyssinia, and the Prophet ﷺ sent her a marriage proposal from Medina while she is in Abyssinia. Because she had nobody to take care of her in Abyssinia. Uh, obviously all of the Sahaba are married there and there's nobody there that, that's going to take care of her. And she is the daughter of Abu Sufyan. I mean, her father is the chieftain. There is nobody more noble alive amongst the Quraysh than Abu Sufyan. And in those days, lineage was the number one reason why you married a woman. In our times, our society has told us it is beauty. But in their society, it wasn't beauty. In their society, the number one reason you married a woman is pride of who the father is. And that dictates a lot about your relationship. Because once you marry into the tribe, now you have something negotiable with the tribe. Right? This is a part of the land. And this is exactly what our Prophet ﷺ did in who he married. Each one of these marriages, there is some long-term wisdom. By marrying the daughter of Abu Sufyan, you are sending a message. And of course, Ramla was who she was. She was of the most loving uh, to the Masakin and Fuqara. She is of the earliest uh, Muhajirat. She, ha she is. The, the, her credentials don't need any praising. But her lineage is unparalleled. She is the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And so the process and proposed for Ramla. And uh, the Najashi himself gifted the Mahar on behalf of the Prophet so the highest mahar of any of the wives of the Prophet was to uh, Ramla. Why? Because one Najashi heard, he became so happy. He was the one who conducted the nikah ceremony. He acted as the wali for uh, Ramla because Abu Sufyan is not a Muslim. He acted as the wali. He's the one who gifted her lots of gifts. So the best wedding ceremony of any wives of the Prophet was Ramla's because it took place in the palace of Najashi. And then he sent her with some trustworthy people to Medina. And we don't know exactly when she arrived, but maybe Hudaybiyah a little bit before, maybe a little bit after, but around this time she's arriving, right? And then in the battle of Khaybar, uh, Safiya binti Huyay, the daughter of the chieftain of the Khaybar, right? Huyay ibn Akhtab, Huyay ibn Akhtab, back from the Banu Nadir, the one who's run from Banu Nadir to Khaybar. So Safiya as well, uh, she is married and we will talk about Safiya uh, inshallah ta'ala next week Safiya bin Tuhiyyah and then move on